In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16, it says there, Great, without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit. Now, what does it mean for Jesus, our Savior, to be justified in the spirit? It certainly doesn't mean that he was justified the way we have been justified. We've been made righteous before God, even though we weren't righteous, right? But he was righteous. <clears throat> he was God in the flesh. And he didn't do anything wrong. In fact, he looked, as no one else could do, he looked at people and he said, who convinces me or convicts me of sin? It could be that by his righteous life, he showed that he was God's man. He, he proved that he was the Son of God. And that's a possibility. But if you have uh, Bibles that have that verse where the Spirit, the word Spirit is capitalized, you realize that the translators there thought of something different than just that he was justified in his spirit or that he was righteous in his spirit. The word righteous could also be uh, translated vindicated. He was vindicated in the spirit. What was that chapter and verse? Did you say? First Timothy 3, I believe it's 16. First Timothy. You said Corinthians. I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I, uh, my mind, my mind and my mouth don't always get together. Now, now, I really try hard to make them work together, but if you are as human as I am, you know that it is possible for your mouth to be saying one thing and for your mind to be thinking another. Who of you has never had that problem? Uh, <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, what else do you want to sell us? <laughs> okay, now sure. give it to me again. For, uh, first Timothy. Three. Three. Sixteen, I believe it is. Three sixteen. Okay. Doesn't it say there? We got you. Without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. Yes, sir. God was manifest in the flesh. Depending on your translation, justified or, or vindicated in the spirit. And it's that phrase that I want to look at this morning. Because I, I believe that. The latter is the greater possibility that, that he was vindicated by the Spirit of God. In other words, the Spirit of God so rested upon him and so manifested himself through Christ and his ministry that God's stamp of approval of the Spirit was upon Jesus Christ and showed that he was none other than the Messiah, the Son of God. And that has implications for us. So I want to review, first of all, what that meant in the life of Jesus. For the Spirit of God to be at work in his life meant that he wasn't functioning on his own. He was functioning through the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, he was, he was God in the flesh. He is God in the flesh here. But he was still functioning in the power of the Spirit. And So let's take a few uh, just... <coughs> peruse through the scriptures and take a, a few glimpses of how the Spirit of God worked in the ministry and the life of Jesus Christ. First of all, we know He was conceived by the Spirit. In uh, Luke chapter 1, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, the angel said, and you will conceive a child. And in Matthew, it says that she was found with a child of the Holy Spirit. In other words, right from the very beginning... Christ had upon his life the mark of the Spirit. His very conception was through the power of the Spirit. He was led by the Holy Spirit. If you look in the Gospels, you find, first of all, that uh, he was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. In fact, one of the uh, Gospel writers, Mark, uh, puts it even more forcefully than that. He was driven into the wilderness by the Spirit. Now, I want you to understand something. What happened in the, in the wilderness was 40 days and nights of loneliness, of 
hunger of facing and fighting the devil and the temptations. Uh, he went into that wilderness not by accident, however. He went not, you know, so that he could put himself under some test, but he went because the Spirit of God led him there. Now, that has implications for us, because if we're led by the Spirit, then that means that sometimes we'll be led into places we don't want to go, just like he was led into the wilderness. It says that uh, after that, he returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. He was anointed by the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 10, verses 36 through 38 especially in verse 38, that how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. We see that in his ministry. His anointing was from the Holy Spirit. He was crucified in the power of the Holy Spirit. The scriptures tell us in Hebrews chapter 9 uh, th that the blood of Christ who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God. He, he was able to offer himself to God through the power of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit at work in his life. He was raised by the power of the Holy Spirit. We're told in Romans chapter 1 that he was declared to be the Son of God with power according to the Spirit of holiness, the Holy Spirit, if you will by the resurrection from the dead. The ultimate stamp of God's approval on the, on the life and the ministry and the work of Christ was that he was raised from the dead. Now, was he the first one to be raised from the dead? No. no. Even in the Old Testament, we find examples, for instance, of Elijah raising people from the dead. Jesus, in his ministry, raised people from the dead. What's the difference between... That and the resurrection of Christ. Huh? Well, that's one difference. And, and that's an important one. Actually, it was raised by the power of the Spirit. But, but a more, I think, important distinction is that those who were raised to life again did what? Die. Die. Died. Again, yeah. He is the first one to die and be resurrected to never die again. So his resurrection is different. And it's the same resurrection we will experience someday. So he was raised in the power of the Spirit. But if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his Spirit who dwells in you. Uh, see, there's a strong correlation there between the work of the Spirit in the life of Jesus and what the Spirit of God will do in our lives as well. We'll talk a little more about that in a minute. He commissioned the church through the power of the Spirit. In Acts chapter 1, he, through the Holy Spirit, had given commandments to the apostles whom he had chosen. He did this through the power, again, through the power of the Holy Spirit. Not only that, but he ministered in the power of the Holy Spirit. We're told that he cast out demons. That, that the Spirit of the Lord was upon him, he claimed, because he had anointed him to, to do the work of binding up the wounded and, and giving sight to the blind and setting at liberty those who were oppressed. This, this uh, passage from Isaiah prophesying the anointed one or the Messiah. This he claimed for himself and his ministry. But it was through the Spirit that he did this. And the Spirit of the Lord was upon him. And as I said, he cast out demons in the power of the Spirit. He did his healings in the power of the Spirit. He rejoiced in the power of the Spirit. His life was, if you will, spirit Filled. And that's uh, one of the things that we need to note. He was a bestower of the Holy Spirit. In uh, Acts, we're told that, that what came upon the early church 
what initiated, inaugurated the, whole, the early church was the, the Holy Spirit coming, and that Holy Spirit was the promise of the Messiah. In fact, he'd been telling his disciples, I can't stay with you because if I stay with you, the Comforter won't come, and you need for him to come. In Mark chapter 1 and verse 8, we're told that he baptized with the Holy Spirit. So he's the giver of the Holy Spirit. He was filled with the Holy Spirit. As a child, it says in Luke, he grew strong in the Spirit. It says in John chapter 1 that the, the Spirit, when he was baptized, descended upon him and remained upon him. We're told in Luke that he was filled with the Spirit when he returned from the Jordan and he was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. He was filled with the Spirit. What, what does that mean? It meant he was controlled by the Spirit of God. And the, oh, excuse me, let me go back to that. And he returned in the power of the Spirit. So we see again the Holy Spirit at work in the life of Jesus. If he, the Son of God, depended upon the Holy Spirit and his work in his life, how much more do we need that power? I want to look just a moment at some comparisons in the scriptures between what Jesus experienced and what we are to experience as Christians because I believe that Jesus was not only the Son of God in the flesh come to die for our sins, but he was also a model for us. His life is to serve as a model for what God wants for us and how he wants us to be and live. We are conceived by the Spirit too. We're born. Uh, John uh, records Jesus talking with Nicodemus about this being born again, this second birth, as the normal need for people. We're born once into this world, but that's not the most important we need to be born again. We need to have a second birth. And uh, in John chapter 3, verse 5, we're told, That which is flesh is flesh, and that which is spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I say unto you, you must be born again. We are to be led by the Spirit. In fact, Romans 8 tells us that the children of God are those who are led by the Spirit of God. So that's something that should be happening in our lives too. And again, as I mentioned, the Spirit of God will <coughs> not always lead you into comfortable places, into pleasant, easy places. You know, we don't need what is easy. And, and let me say this, I think that a part of our problem has been that we expect when a person follows Christ, it's going to be easy and their lives are going to be blessed and and prosperous. And I'm saying to you that Jesus as a model shows us that when the Spirit of God is leading in your life, it's not for your ease, your comfort, or your pleasure. It is for your benefit. Amen. Jesus needed to be in the wilderness and He needed to be tempted so that He would know what it was like for us to be tempted. He was, Hebrews tells us, tempted in all points, like as we are, yet the one difference is he didn't sin. We do. He didn't fail. We have. That doesn't mean, by the way, that we have to fail. It just means that there's a difference. He never failed. But he does show us the way. Because when he was tempted in the wilderness, he depended on two resources that you and I have as well. He depended on the Spirit and the Word of God. Do we have the Spirit of God? Amen. The Bible says, if you don't have the Spirit of God, you're not one of His children. If you are one of His children, He has placed within you His Spirit to, to lead you, to empower you, to help you, to comfort you, to strengthen you. You have the Spirit of God if you are His child. You don't need to beg for it. You don't need to grovel. You don't need to put yourself through <laughs> contortions. If you're his child, he has poured his spirit into your life. And for a reason. He wants to empower you to live <coughs> for him. Led by the spirit. 
anointed. In 1 John, we're told that we have an anointing from the Holy One. That anointing is on us in our lives as well for Christians. It's that same spirit. We are crucified with Christ. 2 Corinthians 13, 4 uh, draws a parallel between the, the crucifixion of Christ and our own crucifixion. We need to die how? <coughs> to die to self that we might be raised to new life. That's what the scripture tells us. And uh, we are raised in the power of the spirit. That same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead is at work in your life and in my life, the Bible says. We are to minister in the power of the spirit. In fact, we're told in 1 Corinthians 12 that the gifts that God distributes are distributed through the spirit who empowers us to utilize these gifts for the common good. And the Bible says that we are to be filled with the Spirit. You see the correlation? You see how Jesus pointed the way? You see he's showing us that the life that he had, the life that he lived, and the power of the Spirit can be your life, it can be my life, if we want it. The difference is, John tells us in, in John chapter 3, uh, past verse 16, get past that, past most of the verses in chapter 3, and you'll come to this where, where John's testimony in verse 30 is, He must increase, but I must decrease. He who comes from above is above all. Not, notice he didn't say he's from above, it says he's above all. He who is of the earth is earthly and speaks of the earth. He who comes from heaven is above all. And what he has seen and heard, that he testifies, and no one receives his testimony. He who has received his testimony has certified that God is true. For he whom God has sent, who is that? His son. He whom God has sent speaks the words of God, for God does not give the spirit by measure to him. In other words, he gives him the spirit without measure. There's, there's such an abundance of the spirit of God at work in the life of Christ and his ministry that you can't measure it. He goes on to say, The Father loves the Son and has given all things into his hand. He who believes in the Son has everlasting life, and he who does not believe the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. You need the life that Jesus Christ offers. You need that because he is... He is the one on whom the Spirit has fallen without measure. God has vindicated His life, His ministry, and His work of salvation. God has put His stamp of approval on Jesus Christ and said, He is the way, He is the truth, He is the life. No one comes to the Father but through Him. That stamp of approval God has placed unmistakably through the power of the Spirit on the life of Jesus. And now what God wants to do is to reproduce in our lives some of that life, some of that power, some of that ministry, so that we might have the impact on our world that Christians and Christianity have always had whenever they operate in the power of the Spirit. Now, we're facing a difficult time. And I'm going to just uh, take that off for a minute. And I'm going to talk to you very plainly. In fact, uh, some people might call it meddling. We've been through some difficult times financially the last few years in our country. And we thought and were hopeful that those times might end. And they haven't ended yet. And we're also hopeful that if we can get some political solutions uh, to the mess we're in, that that would help ease the burden. And through some strange irony, we haven't received that either. What is the solution to our problem? I believe the solution doesn't lie with our government, doesn't lie with our president, 
doesn't lie with the, the Congress. It doesn't even lie here in the political realm in Tennessee. It doesn't lie with bringing in more industry and getting better jobs. Now, I'm not saying that, that that's something we shouldn't be hopeful about. I'm just saying that's not the solution. I'm going to tell you what I believe the solution is. Biblically, I believe the solution is. I believe the solution is God's people. God's people getting right with God and getting filled with the Spirit and operating in the power of the Spirit. I believe that we can make a difference when we get outside of ourselves, when we, when we forget about ourselves and when we move into the realm of the Spirit where we're no longer led by ourselves, by our own desires, whatever they are, by our own wishes and our own wants, whatever they are, by our own comfort zone, wherever we've drawn that line, I believe what we really need is to be led by the Spirit of God as the children of God, being filled with the Spirit of God so that people see there is really a power beyond us. Amen. Amen. And it is at work in us. You know, people are not going to be impressed if you're just comfortable. And they're not going to say, well, I want to be comfortable like they are. Now, sometimes they may say that. But they realize... They're, they're wise enough to understand that that comfortable time doesn't last. They understand that, that bad things happen even in good people's lives. They understand that if you're not facing one thing, you're going to face another. That's what my grandmother used to say. It's not one thing, it's another. She knew 95 years, she knew a little bit about life. About the coming and going, she saw a couple of world wars, and she saw uh, the Great Depression. She lived through it all. She struggled most of her life just to make ends meet, but she made it. She never lost her trust in God. She never lost her compassion. In Psalm chapter 20, the psalmist says, some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we will remember the name of the Lord our God. They have bowed down and fallen, but we have risen and stand upright. In other words, if you put your trust in God, you will not be ashamed. <clears throat> in another place in the Psalms, it says in Psalm 146, verse 3, Do not put your trust in princes. Does that sound familiar? We don't have princes. We have presidents and congressmen and governors. <coughs> Do not put your trust in princes nor in a son of man. In other words, in any other human being. You can't put your trust in human beings. The arm of flesh will fail you, the hymn says. You dare not trust your own. You dare not trust your own strength, in other words. Do not put your trust in princes, nor in the Son of Man, in whom there is no help. His spirit departs, he returns to his earth, in that very day his plans perish. In other words, life ceases. You put your trust in a person, and all of a sudden they're gone for whatever reason. Death, if, if nothing else, will take them from you. Happy is he who has the God of Jacob for his help whose hope is in the Lord his God. That's where our hope and our help lie. Amen. Jeremiah tells us in Jeremiah chapter 9, Let not the wise man glory in his wisdom. Let not the mighty man glory in his might. Let not the rich man glory in his riches. But let him who glories glory in this, that he understands and knows me that I am the Lord. That's the solution. The solution doesn't lie on this earthly plane. The solution is out of this world. The solution is above. And our citizenship is where? In heaven as Christians. That's where our citizenship is. And that's where our power comes from. You know these verses, but Zechariah 4, 6. To a struggling community who had just returned from captivity, and they were seeking to rebuild their lives and their homes and their city and the temple. This is what God says to their leaders, Zerubbabel, 
and the high priest. The word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. The missing ingredient of the church, any church, especially the church in America today, the missing ingredient is not more attendees, is not more money. Uh, hold on, Bar uh, Teresa. It's not even greater interest. <coughs> Because the, the answer, the source lies in this. And if you get this right, you'll have more money and you'll have greater interest and you'll have better attendance. Because when we understand that fundamentally we need God in our lives and we need His Spirit functioning in our lives and without Him we are nothing. When we begin to realize the magnitude of our need and that this is the most important need we have. It's more important than what goes on at work. It's more important than what goes on in, in the rest of our lives. This is the key. Spiritual life. Life walking and led by the Spirit. Life filled with the Spirit. Amen. Life spiritually energized and motivated. When we get our hands around this and when we fall on our faces and cry out to God and say, God, I need you. Remember, though he's not far from any of us, he says to us, you will seek me and find me when? When you search for me with all your heart. That's the missing ingredient. We have got to get serious with God, folks. And it's not about the church and whether it exists here or not. It's not about money. It's not about the, the pastor you have or the pastor you keep. It is all about the Spirit of God at work in the lives of His people. Amen. That's what it's about. And when people see that reality, when they see the Spirit of God working in power in our lives, and then they'll see it most dramatically when we're facing the most difficult challenges. When they see that, and they see how God empowers and strengthens, how He comforts and uses us in the most difficult and challenging times of life, let me tell you, they're going to want what you have. Amen? Let's pray. Father, now we come before you today thankful that we have the privilege of Worshiping a great God, a God who is beyond the limited resources of a nation or the limited resources of a family, a God who is beyond the difficult and challenging circumstances, a God who is beyond our weakness and our limitations, a God who is faithful and loving and forgiving, a God who is willing to empower and strengthen us for life, a God who is willing to stand with us through every storm in life. God, we thank you and praise you for what you've brought us through, for what you've given us, and for what you're willing to do for us in the future. We look to you today. We are nothing. We are weak, frail, limited human beings. We need a fresh filling of your spirit to empower us to live our lives. We need a, to, a fresh touch from you. We need what only you can give. God, we need you. We recognize without you we're nothing. We call upon you. Oh God, touch our lives anew and afresh. Fill us with your spirit and your power. Make us to be the kind of children that you want us to be, that you've called us to be, that you need us to be, and that our world needs for us to be at this moment of, of spiritual challenge. Help us to be what you've called us to be. I pray in Jesus' name.
necessarily because of, well, I mean, dynamic preaching, yes, wonderful, but just from hearing from God's word, that's the truth we need to hear. I, I hope this is your prayer as we leave this place. We're going to close um, with this one last song, and I, I hope this is your heart's desire. The Lord reign in me. Let's stand. Mm -hmm.